Hi, everyone. Good to see you this morning. I'm Drew. For those of you who've been coming to Living Waters just uh, recently, um, maybe you've never seen me up here. I am Drew. Uh, this is my first time that I actually get to preach here this year, which is different than in previous years. I was up a lot before, but life is busy, schedules are busy, and we have a lot of a larger teaching team, and so you don't get to see me that often. So I'm going to make this count. So it's really good to be with you th this morning. Um, as you may know, we just started a series last week, The Parables of Jesus, and Ryan introduced it. And uh, before I get into the text that I'm going to be preaching from today, I want to go over a few of the things that he mentioned last week as some of the rules or, or things to remember as we approach the parables, because these are important. Um, first, before we get into anything else, and you'll hear us on the teaching team say this a lot, context matters. Context, context, context. Uh, for, the, for, for, for those of us in the modern Christian era, sometimes I feel like we approach scripture with almost a postmodern mindset of like, what does this mean to me? This is what this scripture means to me. And I just want to say something that we've said often from here. All scripture has one meaning. Scripture means what it meant to the original audience. So this idea that we have of like, well, what does that mean to you? That's not a biblical idea. And it, it lends itself to really bad biblical interpretation because the scripture will never mean, have a meaning in, in something that was contradictory or different than what it meant to the original audience. But scripture might have one meaning, but it has a thousand different applications. And this is where we get to take that, that understanding of what scripture meant to the original audience and bring it across the cultural bridge to our time to understand this principle that Jesus was teaching in the meaning of the scripture, what and how do I apply it today? Does that make sense? So that's rule number one I want to talk about. So there's a couple different contexts, even with that, that we have to keep in mind. There's the biblical scriptural context of just basically when you get a verse, and we're all guilty of this. How many of you have been guilty of picking a verse, like you want a word from the Lord and you open your Bible and point and you're like, this is my word today. <laughs> oh, come on. I see you. <laughs> raise your hands. This is, uh, Andy was joking. He's like, you always make them raise your hands. I'm like, I do. Because I'm radically honest in my life and I demand the same from every audience I'm with. So how many of you have ever like taken a verse and be like, I'm going to run the race with endurance. And you're like, you have no idea what it said before it or after it. You're just like, I'm running the race. And you're like, that's not what that meant. So how many of you have done that? Just like, let's be honest. So the scriptural context means that anytime we're looking at a passage of scripture, it is a disservice just to pick a thing out of the thin air and say, ooh, there it is, without looking at what it's saying before it, without looking at what it's saying after it. It's really important to understand the flow and the message of scripture or else we can get the meaning wrong. And so it's, it's important. And historical and cultural context is important. As Ryan was sharing last week, when Jesus was teaching parables, he was teaching to a specific culture and time. And so the illustrations, although some of us might understand and get like some of the more agrarian farming type illustrations, because we live in the Rogue Valley and there are orchards and vineyards and we can go like, vineyard, different experience when you're at the tasting room than when you're actually working the vineyard in the first century. <laughs> But we kind of pull some of our knowledge from today into, into those meanings. But it's really important to try to understand the breadth and the depth of the cultural and the historical context so that we can understand what is Jesus saying and how are the people understanding it. And so what I'm going to do today is I'm going to take a parable that I'm sure I have even preached this parable a million times. I'm sure you've all heard it a million times. But what I want to do today is try to, through the, through the help of the historical and cultural context, and even the scriptural context, try to grab what was Jesus saying to this audience and what was the impact it would have on them before we go anywhere else with it. Are you in for that ride today? Yeah. Then if you have a Bible or a device where you can look up your scriptures, I would like you to go to Luke chapter 15. We are looking at the prodigal son story today. Ooh, I heard the rush on the crowd. So what we're going to do is we're just going to begin, before I even begin this, 
Let's talk about the scriptural context. Something Ryan said last week as well is that we tend to take parables as if they're standalone lessons. And just in this one chapter, we see that Jesus rapid fire does three different parables. Now it's not on, on here right now, but if you were to in your scripture, look back to Luke 15 verse one, you see kind of the, the context of what's happening. And it says this, now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to hear him being Jesus And the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. So I want you to see right now in just the context of this interaction that you have two groups of people that Jesus is is interacting with. You have the tax collectors and the sinners that Jesus is eating with and bringing them into fellowship and engaging with them on an incredibly hospitable level. And then you have the Pharisees and the scribes who are just plain pissed about it. And they're grumbling and they're, wagging their fingers and they're like, he's doing this. He's, he's, he's cohorting with these sinners. And, and that's kind of the, the relational context that's in this right now. Jesus begins to respond to what he's seeing with, again, three different parables. I'm not gonna go into the first two, but it's important, I think, for context to understand how he's setting up the prodigal son story. So he starts with the first parable about the lost sheep. And I think we've all heard this, of like the good shepherd will leave the 99 to go find the one. So he starts with that parable, basically presenting to the Pharisees this idea of like a good shepherd, a good Messiah is gonna go after the lost. Then he follows it up with the parable of the lost coin, which is the woman having 10 silver coins and she loses one coin. And who among them you wouldn't, turn over the tables and pull out the couch cushions and search for that one coin. So he's setting up this reality of when you have something that's lost, you run after it. You get the context there relationally and the context of these two groups of people, the Pharisees and the sinners and the Pharisees, well, let's just face facts, Pharisees were also sinners. (laughs) But he's setting up this context. And then in the third parable, he goes into the parable of the prodigal son. And what we're going to do is we're going to read and through, we're going to read parts of it. And I'm going to stop and dissect the cultural and the scriptural context to the different parts so that we can understand it. So let's start at verse 11. And he said, there was a man who had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all that he had and took a journey into a far country. And there he squandered his property in reckless living. We're going to stop there for a second. Okay, first thing, cultural context. The biblical, biblical culture that we had, and in fact, a lot of the Middle Eastern cultures existed in what was like an uh, honor and shame culture. So honor was incredibly important. And when you violated honor or you did something dishonorable, shame would fall upon you. And honestly, we can read in the scriptures, all throughout the scriptures, where you see this tension point and you also see the character of God in contrast to it. If you want to think about like one of my favorite passages of scripture is Isaiah 61, where in Isaiah 61, he talks about for your ashes, I give you beauty. For your shame, I give you a double portion of grace. It's all about this exchange of dishonor and shame to honor. And so you have to get that in your head as we're talking about this, of the shame and honor context. And you have this moment where the son, the younger son, another cultural context is in the biblical culture. The older son would receive a double portion of the inheritance and the younger son or the younger sons would get divided the rest among them. So with two sons, you have the older son who's entitled to basically two thirds of this inheritance and the younger son who's entitled once the father passes to a third of of the inheritance. And so this younger son is saying while his father is living and everything is moving along, I want my inheritance now. In that culture, it would be the equivalent of saying, you are no good to me alive. I wish you were dead because all I want is what you can give me. That's not friendly. In fact, if you were to sit and think about it, any parent out there, if you had a child that came to you and said, I wish you were dead because then I could have your things. The beyond just shame and honor, the relational wound that that would have to have created in the heart of the father. 
a father who has cultivated wealth for his children, and by all accounts in this is a good father, to have a son, his, his second born son, so despise him relationally that he would rather he be dead so he could have the wealth that's coming to him. The relational disconnection here is, is potent. And it was not lost on the culture that was listening to Jesus's words. You can imagine that the Pharisees and the people that were living in the context of the shame honor culture, when hearing the scandalous words of this son, emotions were being brought up already of just like, oh, this guy, he's worse than dirt. This would have been the response. This is a horrible, horrible mindset and horrible relational dynamic. Another thing we have to understand is inheritance in that culture. You see, this is not modern culture where part of an inheritance might mean, okay, well, we're going to sell their house on the real estate market and they got an insurance, life insurance, and so we're going to divide the easy money. Inheritance in this culture was wrapped up in possession and land. And so his inheritance wasn't just a pile of money that he's like, give me the money. It was wrapped up in everything that was producing wealth and livability for the family. So the sheep and the, 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 the cattle and the, the vineyards and the, the, the farming and everything that would have been possession, including parts of the land, one third of what this family as a community lived within and, and survived within, wealth that had probably been being cultivated and earned over generations. This son now says, cut it all up and give me a third of it, which meant that this family now lost one third of their livelihood. They lost one third of the land that other parts of the family were living on. They lost resources. They lost honor among the community because this was so scandalous. And when the scripture goes on to say that he then a few days later gathers everything up and moves, you know, goes off to a, a far country in the original Greek, the, the term for gathering up has this connotation of liquidating the assets. So basically saying what you've developed over generations is so worthless that I'm going to take pennies on the dollar to get rid of it so that I can go and fulfill my desires. Can you imagine the shame and the pain and the relational disconnection that would be present in this? I mean, he's not even getting the full value of the third. He's liquidating it so he can go off and, and just squander it away. Ugh, that, was a, that would be a lot. And then he says he goes off into a far country and there squandered his property in reckless living. And by that term, reckless living, in the original Greek, Greek and I have a lot of connotations. It can just mean like unwise spending. It can mean, you know, lavish generosity to people without regard for your own welfare. It can also mean really sinful, immoral behavior. So it could be that he was just being very overly generous, spending everything, or it could mean that he was spending it all on prostitutes. It, it had a wide range, but none of it was honorable. So we get to this, this point in the story. Does that help for cultural context a bit? So now verse 14, and when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country and he began to be in need. Now, not that you have to raise your hands, but how many of you have been in a situation where you have squandered something and then famine comes? <laughs> we all know that when something like that, when the consequences of our wrong actions begin to hit, we hit a crisis, Right? And this son who does this, he wastes a third of the inheritance, his only inheritance from his good father and family. He wastes it and now famine and, and, and destitution comes and he is now in crisis management mode because the consequences of his actions are catching up with him. How many of you have been there? I won't make you raise your hand, so thank you. Um, I have made a career out of my consequences, but that's okay. For your shame, double portion. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> so it's, he says, it says this, there was a severe famine in that country and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into the fields to feed the pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate and no one gave him anything. Now we have to, again, for cultural 
context and for the context of the scripture, understand what the, the passage is saying here. First and foremost, he's gone off to a foreign country. Now, if you know anything about the rules and the regulations and the national um, requirements of, that, of the nation of Israel, you don't mix with pagan nations. You don't give your sons in marriage to pagan daughters. Like this has been, this has been a thing for a long time in the scriptures that Jesus is, uh, not Jesus, well, Jesus, the Lord God, all of them, Trinity, uh, they all have this standard of holiness of saying you are a nation set apart, a royal priesthood, a people of my choosing. So this national identity wasn't just nationalism. It was you belong to a family. Don't prostitute yourself out to places and people that are going to, destroy your connection to who you are. And yet this is what he's done. And now he is hiring himself out to one of the citizens of one of these pagan countries. But even the Greek word there, hired himself out, it isn't powerful. The, the, our translations aren't powerful enough. It literally has a context of he has attached himself, glued himself to this citizen of this country to try to figure out how to survive. When I was reading some of the commentaries on this, it, it gave this modern illustration of if you've ever been in a big city and you pull up, you know, in your car and someone starts trying to wash your windows and you're like, go away. You know, it's like people or a house guest that won't leave. <laughs> or any, anyway, I won't belabor the point, but essentially the context with the word there was that this, this other person in this nation had no desire to have this, this man attached to him. In fact, there was no doubt that the difference in nationality was very visible. And so in retaliation for his disgust, he gave him the one job that he thought would make him go away. Go to the unclean pigs and serve them. Now, if you understand anything about the cleanliness laws and the Jewish culture, pigs were unclean. You don't touch pigs. Like if you are an unclean individual, you're even further cut off. So literally this foreigner was saying, I want you to go, if you want help, you're gonna go somewhere where I think it'll actually get you off of my back because you won't be willing to stand the uncleanliness of the job I'm giving you. And the pods that the pigs were eating were not edible to this young man either. So the food that he was offering to the unclean animals that were further compounding his shame, although he was starving and hungry, the very food they were eating, he couldn't eat or digest. And so he was further starving, further shamed, further isolated, all the consequences weighing on his shoulders. And it's in this moment that he comes to his senses. As the scripture says, when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger. I will get up and I will go to my father and I will say to him, father, I've sinned against heaven and before you, I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. Now for a lot of us, if we've heard this parable taught, we've been taught that this is his moment of repentance, but that's not what the scripture alludes to. And Jesus, in his brilliance, uses in this story a phrase that the Israelites, in their knowledge of their history and scripture, it would trigger something in their memory. If you look at Exodus 10, 15, uh, Exodus 10, 16 and 17, it's the story of when the plagues are coming against Egypt and Moses is trying to lead the people out of Egypt through the miracles and the plagues that God is doing to make Pharaoh very uncomfortable. And in between the eighth and the ninth plague, this is when Pharaoh says, he calls to Moses and Aaron and says, I have sinned against God and against you. Now, therefore, forgive my sin, please, only this once and plead with the Lord your God only to remove this death from me. So what Jesus is alluding to in this story is that this isn't actual repentance. This is still a dishonorable and a selfish young man who is trying to mitigate the consequences of his actions and saying, if I admit that I'm wrong and if I say the right things, maybe I can avoid starving to death. Now, I want to pause here and say that for a lot of us, when we get stuck in sin or we do something that is that we know is broken or we know we shouldn't have done, it isn't always that our hearts come to repentance first. Our heart comes under the burden of the consequences of our sins. And often 
even sometimes going to the Lord. And I can tell you this, I mean, I grew up in a, in a church tradition where you got saved every year at camp because the last time did not take, you know. And yes, I was baptized twice because lather, rinse, repeat. But, you know, often my times of coming to repentance to the Lord wasn't because I felt the relational break between me and the Father. It was because I felt the consequences of my sin. And this is what this guy is experiencing, the consequences of his sin. And Jesus points that out because we know Pharaoh was not repentant, was he? Because immediately after that plague was removed, when he said, you tell God I'm sorry, he went right back to persecuting the Israelites and God had to bring more plagues and his heart was hardened. Pharaoh was not repentant. Do you know that we can acknowledge that we're wrong without being repentant? And this was the, the heart position of this son. Maybe if I go back, maybe he will treat me as one of his hired servants. Now, something to remember here, and I've preached on this before, and it still stands even though his heart was in this spot. It was the good character of his father that even allowed him to consider he could go home. So moving forward, and he arose and he came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. Now we have to stop there again for again, cultural context. Something that we need to understand first in the mind of this young man, as he's approaching home, we have to keep in mind that there was a tradition in that community when someone had done something like this. And I'm not gonna pronounce it correctly because it's Hebrew, but it was the kazah ceremony. And the kazah ceremony was literally the cutting off ceremony. When you had done something so shameful and so dishonorable, the whole community would know about it because they lived in community. And there weren't no secrets in that little, because there was no Netflix. You're talking about each other, not Netflix. <laughs> so the whole community knew the shameful action of the son. And this kazah ceremony has been practiced in this community for decades and decades and decades and decades. And essentially what would happen is if that prodigal was coming home, the town would go out to the edges the city, the, the people of the city would go out to the edges and they would throw pots on the ground and shatter them to signify you're broken in relationship and you're cut off. There is no welcome for you here. They would be mocked and they would be ridiculed and they'd be cast out, not received back in. So this son, as he's thinking, I know that this is awaiting me. And if I can negotiate a way to say, you're right, I'm not worthy as a son, but maybe I can be a slave. Maybe I can get into the village and deal with the dishonor and deal with this because I have done wrong, even if I'm not quite repentant yet. Which is what makes the father's reaction so freaking amazing. You see, in that culture as well, a patriarch, an older patriarch, did not run. That was undignified. Also, older men, when they reached a certain age, they're, you know, they had the longer robes, not like the stylish knee-high ones that the younger folks would wear. But they, had the, they, they covered their legs because that was, that was undignified for an older patriarch to show their leg because it was uncovering nakedness, and that was shameful. In order for this father to run... And by the, word, by the way, the word run there is not a jog. It is a race. It is a full speed race. The father would have had to hike his robe up. And if you think back to the story of Elijah when he is trying to outrun, you know, chariots or something. I can't remember whatever. You know what I'm talking about, anyone? Hike it up and tear out not just to greet his son, but to outpace the people going to shame his son. 
Essentially, the father is saying, I will bear your shame. I'm going to beat everyone who tells you that you don't have a place. I will beat this ceremony. I will make it to you regardless of the shame that it brings me. And so the father ran, ran to meet his son. His son that had done one of the most dishonorable things that had said to this father, I wish you were dead. This son that was, had polluted himself with everything unclean and was probably still covered in the feces and the mud of the pigs that were an unclean animal. And this father who undignified himself to uncover his nakedness and run to beat the shame also made himself unclean when he embraced and kissed his son. I want us to sit and think for a second about As Ryan said, like when you read a parable, the things that are unexpected that you see happening are reflective of who God is, his character, and the kingdom of God. The things that you would expect to happen, that's what the cultural norm is. The audience expected the kazah ceremony. They expected the broken pottery. They expected him to be cast out. They expected the father to say, you have shamed us. But that is not what the father did. When I contrast that with the idea that Jesus bore the shame of our sin and our brokenness upon himself, that God Almighty humbled himself and took on the form of human flesh, which is also extremely humbling, that the God of the universe subjected himself to being an infant and having his diaper changed. If you think about that, it's a little detail we don't think about at times, but but it's so unexpected that the holy God of the universe would humble himself in such a way. But that's exactly what Jesus is alluding to here, that the father isn't who we expect him to be. So he embraced him and he kissed him. And this was scandalous to absolutely everyone listening to this story. Absolutely scandalous. The son in his response said to him, Father, I've sinned against you in heaven before you. I am no worthy, no longer worthy to be called your son. He doesn't go into the plea to make me a hired servant because the kindness of the father leads him to repentance. We see that in Romans 2, 4, but it's something that we forget. When we acknowledge we've done wrong, that's not Repentance when we even try and go deal with the consequences of our sins, that is not repentance. A Hebrewic way of looking at repentance is literally to withdraw from the path that you're on, turn and go back and reconnect relationally to the Father. You see, the big sin here was not the inheritance. The big sin was not the defiling of himself in lavish living. It was not the pig pen. The big problem was his disconnection with the Father. He had broken relationship with his father. And he recognized it in this moment because of the kindness and the lavish love that the father displayed for him. Of course, we see that the father then said to his servants, quick, bring the best robe, put it on him, put a ring on his hand, shoes on his feet, and bring some of the fattened calf and kill it. And let us eat and celebrate for this. My son was dead. And he is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they begin to celebrate. Do you know that so often we stop there with the prodigal son story? Because we feel like the next part of it is just kind of a byline. But I would like to submit to you that the point of Jesus' story actually rests most powerfully in what happens next. Now his older son was in the field. And as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked what, what these things meant. And he said to him, your brother has come and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has received him back safe and sound. But he was angry and refused to go in. Why? Because the older brother who had been faithful, who had followed the rules, who hadn't shamed his father, was expecting in a justice shame honor system 
for his younger brother to be put to shame and cast out. He had no place in this family anymore. How dare you come back here? And then his father's reaction scandalized him further. His father came out and entreated him, but he answered his father, look, these many years I've served you, I've never disobeyed your command, yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, not my brother, this son of yours, meaning he had not received him back, you might receive him, I don't. When this son of yours came, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. And his father said to him, son, you are always with me and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad for this, your brother was dead and he is alive, he was lost, and now he's found. Jesus was speaking this directly to the Pharisees who were moments before grumbling that God, that Jesus would dare to eat with and celebrate with such dishonorable people. Yes, this is a story about the lavish grace of God, but this is more than that. This, is, this stands across time and history to us today to say, what is our attitude when those that we don't think deserve the grace of God begin seeking it out? A little bit of historical context for this, I think it would be really important to know because this, again, the meaning to this people and why Jesus would share this parable, it had a greater context. And for that, we have to go back several hundred years. In ancient times, the kingdom of Israel, the nation of Israel, at one point was a united kingdom. When it was David and then King Solomon, all of Israel, all the 12 tribes were under one nation. But Solomon pushed his choices into a lot of things that this story represents too. He married foreign wives. He accrued for him wealth. He, although he was wise, he acted real foolish. And one of the consequences of Solomon's reign was that the kingdom of Israel divided in two, into the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom, with two of Solomon's sons taking each kingdom. One son took the southern kingdom, which became Judah. This is where Jerusalem and all, all the events of Jesus' time, all that, who would be called Israel, or the, the Jews, or the Hebrews, or however you want to call them, that would have been the, the tribes of Judah and Benjamin. But 10 tribes were part of the northern kingdom. And back in the 700s BC, this northern kingdom that had divided after the time of Solomon, because of their mixing in with foreign nations and all the things that the prodigal son basically did, this kingdom was defeated and most of them were carried off into slavery, into Assyria, into Persia, into what is modern day Iraq. And this is where the 10 lost tribes of Israel come from. There were a few that stuck around in their capital and that group of people became the Samaritans. Once part of the 12 tribes, a chosen people, a son who squandered his inheritance, mixed with foreign nations, defeated and broken. And Jesus came into a culture and time where all of the cutting off ceremony theoretically had been done. If you, the, the way Samaritans and Jews interacted was so vile, was so discriminatory, was so, so awful. And yet when Jesus came, he came to bring the prodigal back home, to look for the lost sheep, to turn over everything to find that lost coin. And as Jesus is sharing this parable, he's sharing it in a context of a nation that was one, a family that was once together and has now been divided. And he's sharing this, highlighting the reaction of that pharisaical mindset that so many of the Jews had when Jesus began speaking the gospel to the Samaritans, even his own followers. 
The sons of thunder, James and John, wanted to call down fire from heaven to devour the Samaritans. Not a friendly situation. They were acting very much like the older brother. And you think about it, the, the, the Jews that were in Judea, they kept the law. They kept the temple going. They existed under persecution. It might be very reasonable for, for this older brother's response to say, we've been faithful, but you haven't blessed us. We've been under persecution. We don't have everything that we want. And yet you're lavishing your love on this Samaritan, essentially. I think about the, one of my favorite stories in scripture in John, I believe chapter four, it's the, when Jesus meets the Samaritan woman at the well. And this is one of the first interactions that Jesus has to begin to proclaim the gospel and welcome back the prodigal in. And you hear it in the context of her talking. One of those statements she makes is like, well, you Jews say that we have to go and worship here, but where do I go? Because they've been cut off from the temple. They've been cut off from the sacrificial system. The Samaritans didn't even have all of the, the historical books of the Bible. They had the Torah and that was it. They were cut off from the life of God. And Jesus came to welcome them home. You know, Jesus, when he came, his mission, first and foremost, was to go and seek the lost sheep of Israel. It was to his followers that he gave the job of taking it from Jerusalem and Judea and then to the ends of the earth. Jesus wasn't here in his earthly mission to go after the Gentiles. He was here to save the prodigal of the tribe of Israel. And that was not a welcome message. One of the things that I find profound about how Jesus taught this was when the father entreats the older brother You've been with me all this time. Everything I have is yours. Please celebrate with me that the one who is dead is being brought, they're back to life. They're, they've been brought back in. Your brother is coming home. Please rejoice with me. And Jesus ends the story there, not saying how that brother responds to the words of the father. And as we know historically, some of the Jews that followed Jesus and they embraced the message of the gospel were the very ones to go into Samaria and to go into the ends of the earth because they got the lavish love and grace of God, that it wasn't just for them. And that even if there was dishonor and shame that were centuries old, it's the kindness of God that leads people to repentance and God wants his children home. But we also know that there were a lot of other Jews that would not receive that message of grace. And so they killed him. That's a light way to end that part of the story, Drew. <laughs> the historical context is really important for this because again, in our, in our own desire to understand the Lord and to understand the parables, we, we sometimes make it all about one sinner coming home and God's grace is there for them. And that is in there. That is certainly something that we can apply to ourselves from the principle of what Jesus is teaching, but we miss it if we don't also put ourselves in the place of the Pharisees or the older brother. Because the main thrust of this teaching was not about God's grace. It was about whether or not we who say we follow him will embrace that grace for people we don't think deserve it. So for those of you who know me, I, for those of you who don't know me that well, um, one of the reasons why I'm not around a ton is that I'm a volunteer on this team and my, full, my job is going and helping the church respond to this cultural issue and this relational issue of LGBTQ people and how the church responds to them. I have that ministry, I've had, been in that field of ministry for 25 years and I have that because I have an, my own history of struggling with same-sex attraction and my own history of being involved in a gay relationship at 19 years old. And I can tell you right now that I felt very much like a Samaritan growing up. 
because I grew up in the 80s and I grew up in the age and the era where the church loved to throw stones at the gay community and saying that AIDS was God's judgment on that community. That every consequence and every bad thing that befell that community or our nation was because of the gays. And in my own walk with the Lord, I, have, I resonate with the prodigal son story very deeply. I resonate with the Samaritan woman at the well very deeply, a sexual sinner who was an outcast, and yet the grace and the love of God encountered her. That is my story. And so, like I joked earlier, I've made a career out of my uh, former shame. I have. And I know a lot of people in that community who struggle very deeply to ever darken the door of a church because of the way that we collectively as the body of Christ have treated our brother. That's just one application of what the Lord is trying to speak to us over time in history today. But there are plenty. I guess if I were to simplify it down, because clearly not all of you are gonna have my mission and you're welcome, it's not fun in this culture. But every single one of us are gonna run into people who are in our own flesh, in our own sense of self-righteousness, we think are either too far for the grace of God or we would have a lot of obstacles letting them come in. And honestly, even knowing that sometimes and a lot of times when people begin to make their way back to God, it's not out of repentance. It's not out of repentance. It's out of consequence of their sin and actions. And God does not withhold his love from those people. God does not withhold his mercy and grace and lavish love, even if the person isn't emotionally there yet. Imagine the criminal on the cross next to Jesus, realizing the full consequence of his sin and actions, probably didn't feel overly emotionally repentant but recognizing who this man was, the son of God, recognizing my sin has got me here. If I can admit that I'm not worth, that this man is not deserving of this. Literally, it was an intellectual acknowledgement. This man does not deserve this, we do. And what is Jesus's words to that sinner? Today, you will be with me in paradise because it's the kindness of God that leads us to repentance. Not being convinced that we're wrong. If we, if we were convinced that we're wrong and that be the, the issue, many of us would be repentant and we're not. Many of us, when we choose things, know we're choosing wrong, but we want it anyway. God who knows our hearts does not withhold his love or grace if we're emotionally not repentant yet. And for those of us in the church, can we take that example and realize that it is not the acknowledgement of wrong or the winning of the argument that wins people's hearts. It is kindness, mercy, and grace displayed, incarnating the love of God that he has shown us and given to us. Now, I am not gonna presume that everyone in here is holding a grudge against someone or everyone in here is, has someone in their life that's like, you don't deserve the grace of God. I think we're all better than that. But maybe there are some people here today that are struggling with resentment or struggling with the fact that it doesn't feel just. The grace of God just doesn't feel just. I imagine the older brother felt that. The consequence of the prodigal on his life and his family's life was a real thing. And we all want justice, right? I mean, come on. Let's be honest about that fact. How many of you have ever uttered the words, well, that's not fair? Okay, I'm not asking you to admit sin. Raise your hands. That's not fair. Who's, I mean, some of you, some of you need to get right with Jesus that you can't even be honest about that. Maybe there's a person in your life that you're, you're, you're frustrated with God because you see God blessing and lavishing his grace and mercy on them and you just don't feel like they deserve it. Do we want to take a long look at your life and see if you deserve it? 
because I don't. I don't deserve it. Maybe you're the prodigal. Maybe you're here and you know that you've done some wrong things and you're dealing with the consequences of it. And maybe the enemy is trying to convince you that the love and the grace and the mercy of God just is not gonna happen because justice brings shame. Maybe you need to experience the grace and the mercy of a God who will bear your shame for you and run to you. Whatever camp you're in today or any point in between, I think the invitation is the same. We come to the Father. Come to the Father and experience the lavish grace and love that he has for us. And once we receive that, maybe we can give it back. Amen? I'm gonna invite the worship team back up. Father, we could we could talk for hours and never ever reach an adequate description of your great love. We could scour the scriptures for every example of when your grace won out over judgment and still not understand how deep that well is. Father, I think that we need a bit of it today. Lord, I pray that you just pour your spirit out on us right now. Whether we're the prodigal or we're the older brother. We need a deeper revelation of your kindness. We need a a deeper revelation of your redemptive love. God, I want to be known of my life and the life of this community that we look like you. That our patience resembles yours. That our willingness to bear shame or judgment from a community because of the extravagant grace that we pour out is a hallmark of who we are. And God, for those of us who just need to know that deeply in our own hearts, that our, that our wrong actions and the consequence of our actions and the filth that maybe we have covered ourselves in does not stop you from running to us, embracing us, and kissing us. That it never has and it never will. Father, let this word and this truth sink deep. Deeper than the accusations against our own hearts or against the hearts of those that we know that we're just not thrilled with. Transform us into your resemblance, God. Welcome the prodigals home and turn the heart of the brother back to his brother. And Lord God, this is hard. On either end, this is hard. But I know you can do it in us. We sang earlier, God, to, that we make room for you to do whatever you want to. And today, I think you want to pour out your extravagant love on us. May we be ready and willing to receive it.